This is Real Housewives of the Kingdom, a sweet space where you'll hear from the hearts of fellow housewives in the kingdom of God, some just like you and some really different in various walks of life. We will talk about how God is walking with us through the good and the hard. I pray you'll be encouraged and entertained as we laugh and sometimes cry together. Most of all, I hope it reminds you we're in this together and you are not alone. Today is part one of a two-part conversation in my series, Where You Go, I Will Go. My guest is my cousin, Lisa DeBlau. She is a Christ follower, wife, mama of three, and missionary in Lyon, France. I know I said that wrong. If you pictured her spending her days sipping wine by the Eiffel Tower with her Bible on her lap, that's not exactly accurate. Her and her family have been serving France for the past seven years. Today I'm chatting with her about what it's like to hear God call your family to another country, somewhere you don't speak the language and have never lived with the intent to share the gospel, especially when you never thought you'd become missionaries in the first place. She tells us what she loves and what she doesn't and gives us some insight into what missionary life is like and why the people of Lyon. She gives us a real inside look at how it has affected her marriage and children and ultimately her own heart. I think our conversation will have you laughing and crying and just encouraged by how God is moving. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Real Housewives of the Kingdom. Today, I am joined with my sweet cousin, Lisa, and she is a little bit far away from me right now. We are actually on a Zoom call, uh, but it would be very difficult for us to meet because she lives in Lyon, France. Did I say that right? (laughs) Almost, yeah. Close. <laughs> we have a nasal sound in France. So. Lyon. I am not, uh, my husband speaks French, but uh, I am not, um, I, I've learned a little. But um, anyway, my cousin and her husband and their kids are all missionaries in Lyon. And they uh, have been there for several years. And today we are just going to be discussing just kind of the ins and outs of that and what that looks like for an American family to be living abroad and just talk about God's faithfulness. So I would like Lisa to introduce herself a little bit and just talk about who they are from her mouth. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be on the Zoom call with you. I really am. Mm-hmm. It's a bright spot in my day. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'm Lisa de Blau, and no, it's not French. It's a Dutch <laughs> last name. Yep, I'm <laughs> Dutch. Asa all the all time. Know that. <laughs> <laughs> People always like de Blau. Oh, and you're in France. You're French. No, no. It's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Garrett and Garrett and I, uh, we've just celebrated our 13 year anniversary. Uh, yes, Tuesday, two days ago, and we have three beautiful children. Um, Lily Ann was born here in France. She's going to be four in a month. And Theo and Emma, seven, no, eight, eight and 11. Ooh, it's bad when you can't remember their ages. (laughs) Garrett and I are only 35 and I can't remember my kids' ages. (laughs) But yeah, so Theo's eight, Emma's 11. They were born in Orange County and they moved here when they were two and five. Mm, That was so awesome. I, and I'll just say, so Lisa is married to my cousin who is blood on my side, but it is, we have a, the Dutch family is very big and very um, connected. Uh, yes. Our, me and Garrett's grandparents are siblings and there's, there was eight of them and we all still get together on a fairly regular basis. Everybody's kids, grandkids and great grandkids. So yeah, we miss good. that so much when we're here. Mm-hmm. That's something we miss a lot. Yeah. Even though you guys are far away, it is, we still are very connected. And for that, I mean, sometimes social media is social media and technology can seem uh, unnecessary or difficult. But in this case, I really love that I can stay in contact with you guys and that we can be an encouragement to each other. So yes, awesome. All right, well, let's dive into the discussion. Um, I want to start with, uh, did you ever think you were going to be a missionary? That's a big no. <laughs> a really big no. In fact, that is one of the things that is important about Garrett and I is that that came about after, long after we met. We both went to Biola and in at Biola University, there's a missions conference. We met at the end of our junior year at a missions conference with no intent of being missionaries. And it was the only one that either one of us 
ever attended of the mission conferences there. And the thing that was incredible about it is, um, you know, you can never meet somebody in such a small school, but then all of a sudden you can meet someone and everything just shifts. And that's kind of how it was for Garrett and I. And we both, we went around to this missions conference. We met in global awareness line. The global awareness at Viola is something where there's room set up to represent missions around the world. So the people and people volunteer and act. So that's what I was doing. And I was waiting in line to see the day, the day before mine to see how it went. And I met Garrett uh, through a mutual friend in line. Next thing we know, we're talking for a couple of hours and then I have to leave to go to the global awareness. And I'm like, okay, well, per usual at Biola, you may not see the person again, you may. But then that <laughs> afternoon he showed up at the mailbox while I was at the mailbox and his was literally the tiny box next to mine. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's just... It's just wild how that works. And um, and so we were waiting. He's like, well, do you mind if I wait with you? I'm like, sure, I'm just waiting for my friends to go to the next seminar. And they showed up and they were his friends. And he's like, this yeah. is a joke, right? <laughs> and this whole day, he decided he was just going to follow me as I go to my volunteer stations. And the missionaries, there was a French music missionary that went and ministered to the military, actually. And there was a medical doctor in Belgium who spoke on the need for missionaries to come and reach the Muslim world in Europe and the refugees. And this matters because lo and behold, what are we doing seven years into ministry, but music ministry, evangelism, and discipleship, particularly to people that come from the Middle East, from a Muslim background and our re religious refugees. So God is just absolutely mind blowing how he works because it's a foretelling that we had no idea about. Like he was speaking over that day and we had no idea. Even that whole day that we were getting to know each other, we had no conversation whatsoever about going to missions. Um, <laughs> and so it's, it's kind of wild how God takes things and turns them and you just get to be along for the ride. Well, and I didn't mention this before, but you have a musical theater, well, at least music background. You're a singer. Yes, musical theater. I grew up musical theater. I was in a jazz group in high school. That was the reason that I decided I wanted to pursue music. I just couldn't imagine life without it. So I decided I wanted to go to a Christian school. I had always been in public school. I really wanted to be nourished in, uh, during university. So I really felt led to Biola. And Garrett and I were not the people that were looking for spouses. <laughs> Tons of people were, but we weren't. So it's even more incredible. We were very driven towards wanting our own careers in Europe. <laughs> in Europe? In Europe. We both wanted careers in Europe. Oh my gosh. That is so yeah. wild. And how long have you been walking with Jesus? Ooh, uh, I guess that depends on how you view the question. Um, I grew, I was really blessed with two of the most amazing Christian parents and I don't remember, but at four, I know I was told that I had already professed that I believed and I wanted Jesus in my heart. I vividly remember the pastor talking about baptism at our church in San Diego at six years old and saying, that's what I want. Mm. And so I remember going through baptism class um, with my dad and my brother and because my dad had been baptized as an infant and, um, and we all got baptized when I was six years old. They were obviously not. <laughs> I think but, I, was about, um, I was about the same age and I have like the same kind of thing where, I, I mean, I don't really remember not walking with the Lord. And as far as my consciousness goes back, I remember talking to him, him being in my life, me feeling his yeah. presence. I don't really have a moment where I don't remember walking with Jesus, you know? Yeah. It's changed yeah. over the years, obviously, as you grow and get to know him better. Um, but <laughs> yeah, well, I think at 12, I was at, um, I went with our church. I grew up in a military family. So mm -hmm. I went with our church in Maryland to, uh, call, um, sorry, colleges. I almost said that's middle school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> college is middle school in France. <laughs> um, I went to a middle school conference over a weekend and I vividly remember during the worship time, just raising my hands and, and feeling that call to make it personal. Mm -hmm. And I was 12. So mm -hmm. I love that. That's awesome. That's an important thing for people to hear too, that kind of journey of faith, um, you know, as you get to know the Lord and as you get closer and as you make more of a commitment and your commitment kind of, you know, just becomes stronger and different as you grow in mm -hmm. grace and in faith. I love that. Uh, um, that's actually really true. I, I just then I didn't think about this before, but I think maybe this is something that would encourage anybody listening that 
comes from a Christian background, when we were in training for missions, they have you prepare testimony, which Mm -hmm. is really awkward to do, uh, to be honest. But I always struggled with mine because I always remembered. And it came to me as we were studying the Bible during that session that my story and many people that grew up Christians, it's a story of sanctification. Mm -hmm. It's a story of little by little, God's refining you. And little by little, he's sanctifying you for his glory. Mm, I love that. And I think as you grow into an adult, as you grow closer to him, you can kind of look back and see that. And you see that childlike faith where you've stepped out in faith and then how God comes alongside as you're growing. And as you are experiencing life, real life situations uh, through childhood, teenager, adulthood, marriage, parenting, whatever you are walking through and where you're actually seeing your faith lived out. So you're seeing God actually work in your every day. Mm-hmm. And that continues to just like sharpen your faith and sharpen that, um, that yes. in your heart, like, yep. And it's like that confidence that builds. I love yeah. that. Um, now, okay. So you guys are at a missions conference. <laughs> you met, but we're like, we're going to go to Europe and work. We want to go to Europe and work, but uh, we're not about being missionaries. And you guys start dating. How long did you date before you got married? Oh, uh, let's see. We met in March. We started dating at the end of that May. We started talking about engagement probably seven, eight months after dating and waited until we graduated that next year. So one full year later. So from time we met, time we got married it was just over a year and a half I love that and it was I just remember when we met you and it was just Garrett has always been such a gentle kind but like gentle kind boy and I just have always loved him so much and so when I met you I was like oh I love her. She's perfect. It's so sweet. And it just makes my heart happy to see that God brought alongside somebody who is just so precious for him. And I was so thrilled because I always wanted more siblings. He had brother, he had lots (laughs) of brothers and he had a huge family and, (laughs) and I loved it. I was like, yes, this is what I want. I was like, I just more people around me. Okay, so how long when you got, so you get married and how long was it until God called you to the mission field? What did that look like? What happened was we got married in January, 2009. So we had only been out of school eight months or nine months. And so I went, we had a lot of friends still at Biola. So I went back that year to the missions, right? after The missions conference after we got married and the founder of Operation Mobilization was the speaker. And he came up to me afterward and then I was thanking him and he looked at me in the eyes and he's like, I want to talk to your husband. I was like, what? <laughs> he's like, here, come sit up coffee with me. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> and okay. So I obliged and I was really nervous. He gave us his books and he was like, I need to talk to your husband you know, that scared me. It was like, you know, when you know, somebody knows something of the Lord that you don't know. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't know if you've had that experience, but it can be a little frightening. But at the end of the day, we prayed and we're like, well, it's, we just felt it was irresponsible to go into full-time missions. And we were looking at mercy ships with operation mobilization. And we're just like, yeah, that's amazing. We could use our, he could do his skills. I could do mine and we could do it for a year and travel the world. And do this missions, but we would never do it with debt. And we had school loans. So mm-hmm. that was that. It was like, wipe your hands of it. Like it didn't even go on a shelf. It was like, that's yeah. the end of it. And you guys weren't originally, were you originally planning to have kids or you weren't originally? No. I mean, they say have premarital counseling and they are right. Cause you talk about all those things. Right. And you need to, we, he was on the same page as me. He knew that I wanted a career singing on cruise ships, you know, mm-hmm. doing jazz music in Paris and, And I had two amazing parents that modeled the sacrifice that it takes to be a parent. Mm -hmm. And I just knew in my gut, I was a really selfish person that could not (laughs) surrender and give that kind of love. I just was like, no way I can't do it. If I can't do it as good as they did, I don't want to do it. Um, And it was just one of those things. And he's like, okay, whatever. (laughs) And I was like, are you, and he would say things when we were engaged, like, oh, someday my kids. And I'd be like, no, 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 wait, we're not having kids. (laughs) And he's like, oh, someday my son. And they'd be like, oh, no, 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 wait. Remember, you agreed. We're not having kids. <laughs> um, and it was, and people knew too. It was really clear. People knew we weren't going to have kids. And that is one of the biggest, I think, testimonies of my life is 
that God chose to surprise us with Emma. We were only eight months married <laughs> and we got pregnant and, and it, you know, it doesn't matter what you do to stop it. Like if God wants it, it will happen. Yep. And, um, and so I found myself in the most, one of the two most difficult years of my life was that first year of our marriage and pregnant and in his grace, God gives you nine months. And, <laughs> and when you surrender your life to him, he works through all things Yep. Of course, Garrett, it took him about two weeks and then he was like all on board. Yeah. He's, he's like, like, let's okay. do this. <laughs> it was two weeks of kind of sitting in shock. And then it was like, he was all in, um, which I'm so thankful because one of the things that I love most about Garrett is that I, when I watch him, I know he was meant to be a dad. Mm. He is just, he's good with kids. He's everything I wish I could be as a mom. He just has that thing, you know, where he has the organization, he has the teaching, like he has the mannerisms that just make it so fun for them. And I, I love it. I love that I get to give him children to be a father (laughs) because it's so great, but it's true. That wasn't our plan, but our plan was to leave and go right away to Europe. And God didn't allow that. Instead, Mm -hmm. he took music from my life and I became a full-time mom and it's not all, I mean, I had an amazing job at Disney. I had a dream job at Disney that I was very intent on keeping, but during those five years after our marriage, he allowed us to find really deep roots in Orange County of all places. And we were really intent. And one day Garrett decided to go before the Lord and offer up his life and say, what do you think about my life, Lord? <laughs> and I was eight months pregnant with Theo. We had started a public transit missions ministry where we sold our car and we took public transit so that we could be available in however God wanted somebody to be used. And it so quickly became something that we just nicknamed it public transit missions. And during that time, Garrett was working for a nonprofit company, not like a missions organization. And he just offered it up, <laughs> expecting God to like pat him on. He'll tell you, he's like, I expected God to pat me on the back and say, good job. Keep going. Um, and Well, because you and, were already um, mi- doing mission, uh, yeah. so to speak. You were already like, we're missionaries in our backyard, you know, kind of. A yes, thing. we're missionaries to our neighborhood. It was a very international neighborhood. When you start writing public transit in Orange County, one, you see how impossible it is. And two, <laughs> you see how crazy people think you are. And three, you see that it's really um, people immigrating that are the only ones on public transit. And when people immigrate around the world, what happens is they're, they're raw and they're vulnerable and they're open and God reaches those people like that. So during that time, this happened and I came home, Garrett tells me, and I said, mm, you didn't quit your job, did you? <laughs> because I just knew, I knew it was serious. And I'm like, well, we're going to have a baby in three weeks. <laughs> a very uncertain time. (laughs) Yes. So suffice to say, you know, we are both people that seek after God's wisdom. He did not quit his job, but he was bringing it before me as um, a partner and said, I really feel like this is something. So we took six months to pray. And that was really how we came into mission work is during those six months, we, we came from families who financially supported and prayerfully supported missionaries, but we did not come from missionary families. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have any expectation or any idea what it it looked like, like. how it worked, any of those things. We were just freelancers. (laughs) Just like, you know, like at church when the missionaries come back home for the week and for two weeks and they speak about what they're doing and you're like, oh, that's so great. Yeah. We're, you know, support you. That's awesome. You know, but it's still removed from you a little bit, you know, yes. It's not your life. Now, how did your families respond as you were moving towards this? Did you tell people while you were praying about it or did you pray about it kind of quietly? I haven't really thought about that. Yeah, we did tell people while we were praying about it. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's not something we should have done, but (laughs) we actually, um, we had the public transit missions became such a thing. We created a prayer letter newsletter that we sent out every month. And ask for people to pray about the things that were happening. So God kind of used that to show us we already were missionaries. He just wanted something more. Um, And we're like, well, it's not to stay and do public transit missions in Orange County. So we're going to pray. And so we just sent it out and said, here's what the Lord put on our hearts. Would you pray with us? And we started having conversations with our pastor and our families. And some people were like, nope. And some people were like, wow, that's really hard to hear, but we get it and we support you. So it was definitely a huge mix of responses, but from the people that we trusted there and respected their faith in the Lord, all of them resoundly after listening to the story 
the testimony of how we arrived, they just all affirmed. But they also affirmed and made sure we understood how hard the path is that we were about to take. And that it was not something that could be jumped into. We had this idea we're going to, you know, at Biola, there's a program, Businesses Missions, and Garrett, the professor, is such a dear friend of, of ours after Biola, and I took one of his classes, and and we respect that idea so much that we just thought that's what we do. We thought Garrett's going to take his consulting work, because one of his jobs was doing IT consulting, and, and he's going to do that there, and we're going to, in France, in Lyon, when, when we came upon Lyon, <laughs> mm-hmm. he'll do that there, and we will um, do missions as part of what we do, like what we do here. And everyone resoundingly said, no, you need to join an organization. You need to join the team. <laughs> so during those six months, all we knew was that God had called us and that people were really advising us to not what we call cowboy it and just go. Right. To let, um, make an informed decision. Like you're, you're praying about it. And you're, you're making the steps as God is telling you to do, but not just like, oh, let's just see what happens. Yeah, Commit, to really committing. be prepared. Committing, actually. Yes. Realistically. And committing yeah. to a team, which was hard for us. Yeah. It, it, that's. I think that's, honestly, I would say that's hard thing to do in Southern California. I feel like, Cal- well, California in general, the, I don't know, just the culture of it is very, not very community oriented. Even if you do get set in the community of a church, I feel like, California is very to only to a certain extent. Well, we are part of this community, but this is what we do kind of a thing. There's not very much culture in like we're in this and like this is our family and this is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I definitely struggled and we both struggled in Orange County and not in a disrespectful way, just in every culture has their downfalls and the shallowness that we experienced. And when the Lord didn't take us to Europe, uh, in year two of our marriage, we just sat down and, or no, in year one, we sat down and we prayed and we said, Lord, if you won't take us overseas, what would you have for us here? We need community. And the Lord provided within a couple months, an incredible church, our Sunday church is Grace Fellowship um, in Costa Mesa. It was the place where we finally found true community. That church really does community. And they really came around us when we got pregnant with Emma and they ministered to us Mm -hmm. and they became our true family since we didn't have any family there. My Mm -hmm. family didn't, my family, well, my dad retired back to San Diego, but Garrett's family was up North in California. My family was down South and we didn't have any immediate family around us and friends after college, they move away. And it's really just the two of you. And then you have a baby <laughs> and you're 23 years old. <laughs> and so they they were our community in a place that is very difficult to have community, I would say. They came around us and and um, helped us get through that time of prayer. And it was at the end that, that the first thing the Lord showed us was Leon. And how did he show you Leon? Like what? Uh, literally, <laughs> literally. Um, Garrett decided he would look up. He didn't know what to do. He was looking for direction and what it was God wanted. And so he thought he'd go back to OM and, and look at their website. And as he was looking at an IT position to fill as a missionary, the word Leon was on the screen. Like when people take those tourist photos with the name mm-hmm. of the city. Yeah. And he's like, Leon, what's Leon? Mm-hmm. And um, he looked it up. He took two weeks and he really couldn't find much of why anybody would go to Leon or Christian presence. And this was eight years ago now. And it's thank the Lord, like he isn't doing a movement here. It's changed so much. But during those two weeks, he had conversations with our now teammates on, he found through um, the English church's website. Mm -hmm. And they just laid out the reality of the need. And one thing that he saw right away about Leon was that it was a city built for public transit. It is on two rivers. It's built around the Metro being on foot and we were in a public transit ministry. So he captured our eyes with this place that was so ideal for doing public transit ministry, right? <laughs> but then he captured our hearts with the need of, you know, less than 1%. In Lyon at that time, it was 0.02% of true followers of Christ. Wow. And we were just like, uh, I mean, just speechless, just like that. We're just like, this, how is that possible? And God taught us the same way that every person we've shared the mission that he's given us to do 
with, we've had to teach them too, because most people are like, why would you go to France? <laughs> like, why are yeah. like, oh, that, no, but what's crazy to me when I reflect on this story, I can't express to you enough that here we give God our time and our energy and prayer and listening, thinking, oh, we're going to go with YWAM and our friends that do ministry in Thailand, or we're going to join our friends doing teaching in, in Vietnam, or we're going to go you know, to these places we had people involved in already. That made sense. You know, your eye sees the need, you go to the need, right? But after this time, God opened the door to go to France. We're listening and we're willing to go anywhere and do anything. And he says that. And so the, there had to have been something so important that he stopped what a couple was doing and knew that they were going to listen and said, I want you to go here. And it's true what we have seen since being here. We know it's and what we see coming and not to talk about outside of Christ, but around the world and governments and things, what we see coming, Leon is such an epicenter for what's happening we know where, where we're supposed to be. And we know he has big things in store for his body of Christ here. And he wanted us here for it. So oh, awesome. <laughs> well, and it's so crazy too, because you had said that you always wanted to be like a jazz singer in Paris. So, and that you both wanted to go to Europe. And it's so cool how God does that, how you have these desires, like, oh, I've always wanted to go to Europe and in your, and live in Europe. And in your mind, you think this is a desire of mine. But truly, it's like God placed that desire in you. And even though it didn't end up looking like what you initially thought it was going to be, you had already gotten used to the idea of, oh, I'd love to go and live in Europe. That was already something that God was like mm, working in your yes. heart and kind of pulling you in, using the things that you love about, about certain cultures and things like that. And I think it's not a mistake. Like sometimes you know, I love, we love traveling and we love kind of the, the fly by the seat of your pants life. We've always kind of enjoyed that. And, and I think God's really blessed us through that and used us through yes. that. And I love I just, that about you guys, by the way. I love that. <laughs> yeah. But it's funny because I, when I wanted to get married, because I always wanted to get married young, I always knew I was going to, my mom always knew I was going to, she prayed, she said, God told her, Caroline's going to grow up quick. She's going to get married young. So she was always praying. And it's so interesting because I was, you know, in my mind, I thought that's like what I desire. And I want a, a husband who's like passionate about marriage. And I, I desired that so much. And I thought, you know, almost like I wasn't going to get it because I wanted it so bad. And, but it's like, but God gave it to me. And that was something he put in me to want mm -hmm. to have yeah. so that I would be prepared when he brought Kevin to me and it's kind of like with you guys in France, it's so yeah. cool that you guys had that already in your, it, you know, kind of just like in your mind that that was something you would be willing to do. And yeah. we think it's us saying, this is what we want, but it's like truly how God can use the things that we desire and love and our personalities and our characters and our experiences, and then move us into what he's having us do, which incredible. <laughs> yeah. That's such um, a, that's such a good point. I'm really encouraged at the conclusion you've drawn. <laughs> good. <laughs> but it's true. When I, when we arrived at language school, we were around doctors that were going to Africa, learning French. Did you and, do um, school in the States or one? No, no, we did it just an hour, an hour and a half, an hour and a half outside of Lyon in a countryside town that the, it was a missionary language school from over six years ago that trained people going to Africa. And only recently people that are staying in France have really done it more. Um, but these doctors, they listened to their stories of how they knew at 12, they were, God was going to call them to be a doctor and go to the mission field. And I was like, oh, gee, just the stories you hear is just incredible. But it made me realize something so special. When I was little, I just remember feeling like I wanted to learn French and I wanted to be there. I just wanted to be with French people. Mm -hmm. I remember being like 10 or 11 and just thinking that would, that would be so cool. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it wasn't like some grandiose idea that I aspired to. It just was, I remember thinking that back then. And it was so generous of the Lord to, to show me that that calling isn't always this you know, you will go here. This is, it's not calling yeah. is such a, a term we use to describe something so special and intimate, the Lord, something he places inside of us that can be really small, that has significant pur purpose many, many years later. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always have to be this 
go into full-time ministry. Like, right. And you're going kicking, screaming, go to this country that you hate or you're terrified of or whatever, yes. but it's like, God places these things. And the thing is, I, and I've heard people say this and I love this. God is a gentleman. And when God speaks, sometimes God speaks loud and booming, but often he speaks in a whisper. And I think about that mm-hmm. scripture that says he was not in the wind. He, you know, yeah. it, it was a still small was in the fire. He was in the still yeah. voice. Yeah. yeah. And I feel like he does that and he waits, he beckons us and he whispers to our hearts and he waits for us patiently to act on that. And then he whispers again and he waits for us to act again. And when we engage with the Lord in that way, it's precious. And you don't, you know, he, he doesn't put you anywhere. He's not going to equip you to be. And Mm. so, and that's, what's really cool to see kind of through your life, how God pulled that in and pulled that love of French people and that sort of a thing. Did you take French at all before you left? Or had um, I was a I was a music major. So as part of the vocal degree, you choose a language to study more deeply in the opera languages. So I had studied French. I, in fact, everyone had convinced me not to study French most of my life. They're like, you live in you're in high school in Cal. I was in California, mm-hmm. so you live in high school in California. You should learn Spanish. I really didn't enjoy learning. I was not exceptionally gifted in language and it just didn't click. So I stopped after the requirement. So then I'm like, I'm starting over. I am going to learn French. I've always wanted to learn French. Within two or three months of language school in France, I covered everything that one year did, even at university in a submersive setting. Um, it's just incredible. But I, I, it's funny what you said before. I don't want to give the impression that I just immediately... <laughs> was willing to go, even though God had planted it in me. Because when Garrett did say Leon, I walked, I, he, I was passing him by. I'm like, yeah. And I walked out, I walked back in the room. And I was like, no, <laughs> no, we're not going. And it was this beautiful. How old were your kids at this point when that? Theo had just been born. He was six okay. months old. So Emma was four and a half. Okay. No, no, sorry. Three and a half. She was three and a half. Yeah three and a half. They're three years apart. And that's a huge, that's a huge thing too, because as a mother, you're trying to like, okay, so it's not just us saying, let's, let's pick up and go. We always said we would, yeah. but let's do it. It's like, okay, well, I got these babies to think about and we have family and are we going to leave and go, you know, not be near family with our children and how is that going to look? And yeah, yeah, it is um, something that God definitely had prepared me for growing up in a military family. And it was one thing that I wasn't afraid to face. Mm -hmm. I will say now living it out seven years as a missionary, the reality of that is heavy. Even no matter how prepared God made me for it, it is still a battle we choose to live. We don't live in a place where we have third world problems of water. I mean, just basic things, but even without those things, the sacrifice of giving up normal, giving up your culture, giving up your language, giving up your family, giving up a community. That's something that is unanimous among people that work overseas, not even just missionaries. That is a struggle. And so I do feel like God prepared me to be basically completely equipped from my own experience as a military kid for my missionary kids, but also equipped to help my husband learn how to do it and learn how to be there for them and understand the things that you need to proactively think about. That part wasn't ever a question for me. It was like, God just put it in me. I knew I could do it. Living it out, it hurts and it's hard. And it's in love endures all things, Mm -hmm. you know? So it was definitely a huge moment for me though, because I wasn't, I I didn't want to go to France and Mm -hmm. I just thought anywhere else. (laughs) <laughs> and, um, and Garrett came to me after two weeks, he's like, the Holy Spirit really is pressing upon my heart. I think we're supposed to go. And I need to know, is it the Holy Spirit telling you no or not? So he took the kids to the park, <laughs> said, would you please just spend time in the word? Because I can't do anything else until we're on the same page, which for me is, is a vital part of marriage for me, yes. the, being the on the same page, making the decisions honoring. together. That is the thing that breaks me the quickest. If we don't, if we're not there. And even on field, the thing that pushes me over the edge every day when things are already, you know, they say missionaries and people that live overseas are at 400 times the stress level of anyone else. When, when we're not in sync, that's the thing that breaks me when I'm overseas. And, and that was an amazing 
foundation for us to start and testimony to God that that's how it started. It's like, we're going to be on the same page about this. I need you to seek the Lord. And I, he left, I opened my, my Bible and I read, and I'll probably cry. I always cry when I'm like talking about God and my personal life because God is so good. But it's in Psalm 96, he says, sing to the Lord, a new song, sing to the Lord, all the earth, sing to the Lord, bless his name, proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day, tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among the peoples. And it's so amazing that it's God's word that penetrated my heart. (laughs) So it's, um, it's a real gift because I wouldn't want anything else. You know, I wouldn't want any other person's influence or any outside influence to have been the platform in which God said go. Mm. So, well, and sorry. It's, it's, it's so, no, it's so sweet. And it's so cool to see because like I was saying, God is a gentleman and he whispers. And it's so sweet that God used Garrett to lovingly say, hey, look, I, I need to be on the same page with you. And I'm really feeling this and I need you to go before the Lord. And for God to just so sweetly, when, when he speaks through scripture like that, you can't deny it. And when your heart hears him speaking through, through scripture to you, it's just undeniable. And that part about the nations proclaim it to the nations. You're like, okay, okay. Yep. <laughs> so go to Garrett and you say, okay, let's go. <laughs> Yeah, that started a progression of a three hour weeping before the Lord and, yeah. and, and humbling myself and God giving me visions for things yeah. to pray for. And he came home and I said, okay, it's Leon. So that was, that was, uh, I think November, 2013. Mm. And then that's when, when we started saying, okay, well, who do we go? Like, how do you want us to go? Who do we go with? Hey guys, I'm here with my hubby. And as you know, we are super passionate about equipping people to thrive in marriage. One of the best ways you can do that is by having premarital counseling. We did it, and it was super helpful in learning how to communicate and dive into subjects that should be discussed before you reach the altar. Many couples are finding it unnecessary or are not plugged into a good church where they can find good counsel in that area, or they just think counseling is for couples with problems, and that couldn't be further from the truth. We are excited to announce a new project we are working on. We will be offering an online premarital guidance course that you can purchase and access on your schedule. We think everyone should go into marriage with the right tools to thrive and not just survive. We don't have a launch date just yet, but stay tuned to hear more on the podcast, which by the way, will now be airing an episode every week. And now back to the show. And um, God led us to reach global, which... At the beginning, we're like, oh my goodness, spending a year and a half in training and support raising. Like we just, we felt this, one thing we both had was this really deep sense of urgency. Like we have to get there now. And that was such a huge lesson for me. And I think, I I wish all people could experience this, but that was true. We did need to have that urgency, need to get there now. But that was because when we arrived, we did language school and the time in which we arrived in Lyon the day that Garrett walked into a Bible study and that, and that same Bible study, three Iranian refugees walked into that day and said, we believe, teach us God's word. And at that moment, there wasn't anyone to do the work. And Garrett's like, I have a background in Middle Eastern studies. I can do it. <laughs> and that is how he came upon this huge, huge ministry of religious refugees. And he was already doing multiple Um, ministries that year to figure out what it was God was calling him to do here. One is, you know, within a French context, but the other is, is hugely in this refugee context. And he started this huge, tiny, tiny home project that he works with all the pastors and priests and in the city. And he works now with some of the politicians in the city to get approved and start these tiny home projects for short-term housing. I mean, just the things that God has built but we did need to be there at a certain time in a ter- certain place. So we needed that urgency. That would have been four years earlier. We needed that mm-hmm. urgency to be at the time and the place, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that was Reach Global. Even though we were hesitant because of the time frame. God knows. God knows and he leads you to good things. And they equipped us and they prepared us like I've never seen in another organization. And we are so blessed every day by the equipping we had. 
how quickly, so when you decided Reach Global, how quickly did you move to France? Faster than most people because we already had our newsletter from public transit mission. So Mm -hmm. we, we were kind of an anomaly. We had already come with supporters. We had already come with prayer and financial supporters. And, um, and so we joined February or March in 14 and we arrived in France, December, um, it, right two weeks before Christmas in December, 2015. So it was less, it was about a year and a half. Yeah. Wow. So when you got there, did they have housing for you? Did you have to secure that? How did that all work? Um, you know, every organization works differently. Ours, um, has you train in language school and we chose a language school that was a family center. So, and it's very rare. There are only two facilities like this in France that I'm aware of for families for long-term study a year to a year and a half, but they gave us the option to live in the city. And we said, we're going to move to France. Why would we go and live in missionary dorms around other missionaries and not take the opportunity to get to know our culture? of our new home. So we asked, most people get put outside this, outside of the center as a last, last pick. And we asked, and we got placed with an amazing widow who became our family. And it was like, God just blessed us. And and she brought us into her family's hub there, which she's from that region and took us under her wing. And we still go visit her and keep up with her all the time. Um, And it gave us roots, like a new home because we arrived and it was like that feeling that you can't describe, but God's told you to do something. And when you arrive at that place where you finally get to do it, there is peace, but yet there's this adrenal high and it's just, there's nothing like it. Yeah. And that was it for us. And so much uncertainty, like, okay, we've done the year and a half uh, preparing and going, okay, this is where we're going. This is what's happening. And then you finally get to that thing. It's like, okay, we're here. All right. Now what Lord, (laughs) you know, now what's the next thing? It's almost like when you're on a roller coaster and you get up to the top and you're looking down at this hill that you're going to go down, but it's stalled. Here we go. (laughs) Yes. That's actually really good. You know how you take off on a roller coaster and you're going up and it's like, chug, 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 Uh chug. Well, I would say the year and a half that we spent preparing and support raising. And then the year and a half we spent in language school in France, all of it was like chugging. It was like chugging. But when we got to language school, we had that moment of peace of like, this is it. But we had a thing we were doing and it was when we had to make the choice to leave because we had some really blessed ministries while we were in language school that they didn't want us to leave. They asked us to change our plans and stay the, wow. the team that we were working with there. And Garrett said, no, God called us to Leon. We're going to Leon. And how and far so it was, was like school from Leon. Was it? It's like driving from LA to San Diego. Okay, so like a couple of hours. Yeah, an hour Definitely and Definitely not in community of Leon. Definitely like no. Well, we would go in for our team meetings. Yeah. Um, while during language school to be a part of getting to know them, and it was just crazy because you're there and you're like, yes, this is amazing. I'm on the ride, and then you go to move to the city and you realize that I've never lived in a big city. God hasn't outlined the service he has for us. He's just said, go and start serving, go with the ambition to serve is what our team leader says. And that is what we say to all missionaries that we talk with now that want to go full time and we're like, go with the ambition to serve, start there. It was like, okay, here we go. (laughs) We don't know what we're in for. And you know, God's going to do amazing things, but it is like, okay, hold your breath because we're waiting for God to do something. (laughs) That's, that's awesome. Now, um, what were, so when you got to France, what were like the pros and cons? How did your kids respond to it as well? Um, I think that that's two parts in Albertville. That's an, is -hmm. the name of the city we were in for language school. And it is a chauffage. It's, it's a warming station because the town is so Savoyard people are so different from other French people. They're warm and they they are so patient and they want to help you. And it's incredible. So it's a great place to get started in France because you get this warming phase of preparing you to be launched into the difficult world <laughs> where it's cold and people don't want to talk to you. And um, the kids themselves had an amazing time. So all of us left and we just kind of in that plunge down the roller coaster, we all just kind of hit bottom. And it was the first year in Leon was the hard, one of the two hardest years of my life. I was pregnant with Lillian. 
I was very sick, um, which that in itself is a huge long story and testimony, but God led us to ask him if he wanted a third and he said, yes. So we trusted him that I'd be able to have a third and I did, but that was a very trying year in ministry and in our family and our marriage. It just really taught us how, when you experience the most difficult things, you can either give up or you can say, God, you have us here. So until you take us from here or until you change it, we need you to act and we need to see you move. And so it was a year of seeing God just respond like this, like Mm -hmm. snapping your fingers, just everything we, we brought before him, he would respond to whether good or bad. Mm -hmm. Um, Our children were heavily bullied uh, when we moved to the city. Thea was four, Emma was seven, and both of them in their own scenarios, they didn't have, they started school in September, Thea was four. And in France, you go to school at three. So that's really hard culturally for us. Yeah. Um, and so at four, you're, I mean, you have up until a certain point, you have a choice on how often you spend a, th- send a three and a four year old, but for the most part, he was in full-time school and, um, that was hard enough as it is, but then to find out that as politely as possible, French kids are just rougher here. Like he was bitten a lot. He was, you know, little kids would like grab him by the collar. I mean, you're talking about four-year-olds and that he really had a hard time. And that was how we found out Emma was also getting bullied. And in that time, you know, missionaries, they get drilled about, um, from supporters and from other people. How are you taking care of your family? Are your kids okay? You know, what are you doing to look out for them? All these things, but what kids need is a stable home. They need to be loved They need you to teach them about who God is and how to rely on him. And they need to know how to love God and love his word and, and be safe in their home. Um, And we taught them those things. And we used as opportunities as a four and a seven-year-old to ask the Lord to give them a friend, Mm -hmm. just one friend, because that even then, let's see, September through April, that's how long it took for each of them to have a friend. And can you imagine at four and seven, moving to a foreign country, moving again in that foreign country And not having any friends. How did they do with the language, picking up the language? Oh, Emma has a gift of languages. She was fluent in three months as five-year-old. Oh my gosh. They actually took her out of the special English classes, said she didn't need them. And people (laughs) think when they meet us, they thought that one of us is French because she speaks without an accent. So (laughs) yeah. And Theo learned the two languages at the same time. So for him, it was instilling English at home and helping him learn the difference from when he heard French and English. So for us, it was a very blessed, it can be a very, most people we know as expats or missionaries, it's a very difficult process, but God knew there'd be other difficulties. So his grace just poured in there and took care of it. So they're being bullied and they're, and you're encouraging them to pray for a friend and just kind of have that solid home foundation. And I think also it's hard because I think as a parent, you always want to protect your kids from difficulty. But what an oh, opportunity yeah. to come alongside them in hardship and give them tools to deal with hardship versus just, you're not going to have hardship until you become an adult and you're not here anymore. Yes. But, like, but yeah. like, hey, this is hard and I'm so sorry. And I'm sure your mama heart was like dying oh, inside. I was um, ripped apart every day. I was on my knees in prayer constantly for if he doesn't release them from the situation for him to change the hearts of those around him. And really at the end, that's what I learned. It was about, we were praying for the bullies. We were praying for the kids that were hurting them and we got to watch them change. And we said, Lord, change, change this situation until you bring them out of it. Cause we can't stay in this situation. The, and we said, tell us what it is we need to be searching for. And what we realized is we needed teachers that understood what it was like for our kids to be in the situation they were in and being willing to do something about it to protect them because that was what we were realizing we had no power over and and they weren't doing the in the public school for them and that they weren't willing to do because they didn't have the time to and their version of discipline was we don't know who's right and wrong so you're both getting punished can you imagine a kid who got bit and and is like this teddy bear of a boy and and being forced to be in time out because of it like yeah. that's what the school culture is unfortunately like in many places in France and it was very you know, most people I know, and this isn't a bad thing, I, I was right there too, would be like, okay, then that's a sign you shouldn't be on field. Like you could have that perspective. And, right. and, and that is one perspective, but we just decided we were going to lean in and not let go. And that early spring, God provided a bilingual school literally down the street from our house that had one space left in each of their classes for the next year that 
the teachers understand what it's like for kids to be expats and they were willing to go the distance and helping our children fit in and, and making sure that they were protected. That's when everything started changing for us. And, and having lived through that experience, realizing how deep your trust in the Lord can go. Wow. That's, and that's a really good point. I think sometimes as Christians, even though Jesus says, you will have trouble in this world, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Even though the Bible is very clear about the fact that it's not going to be this easy ride as Christians, I think we, if I'm being honest, we all second guess when there's a little bit of resistance or something like, Lord, is that you stopping me? Mm -hmm. Are we supposed to? And I think the thing is, is with all of it, sometimes, yes, maybe it is, but sometimes it's not. And I think the important thing is to really, when you are in the word, in relationship with Christ, that's really the only way you can tell whether this is something, this is hard, not because I'm turning and running from God the wrong direction, but this is hard because this is something God still wants me to do. And he wants me to take his strength. But I think, Mm -hmm. you know, you can't really, you can't assume just because it's hard that, okay, well, it's hard. So we're just going to stop doing it. (laughs) Yes. Oh, yes. It um, always feels so good when, when the sister or brother in Christ you're with is just there in that yoke with you. And you're like, yep, that's exactly it. Like, it's just, and that's something that we don't get a lot here. Most people, I mean, the reality is, the next person I walk to on the road, they're not going to know Jesus, have heard of him or know who he is and the truth of who he is. Right. And most people we're going to befriend. That's not someone in the church is not somebody that's going to relate to us on that deeper level and, and may never choose to, and they'll let you talk, but they may never choose to go there with you. And that leaves you really lonely. And in, in France, the culture is very isolating. So I love having that moment with you because it's something that I, I, it's like I thirst for it when I'm here because I sometimes I just don't get enough of those moments where like you get it and I'm and I'm just we're in that same moment of we are the body of Christ and you get it you know well and how is it so interesting because the um here in the states you know there there are a lot of amazing believers a lot of amazing churches that are you know, equipping people and a lot of amazing, uh, body of Christ communities. But then again, there is also this sort of, I think it's an Americanized, um, view that the church is here to serve me. And if you're not serving me well enough, then, um, then I'm out, you know, we're going to do something different. And I think it's kind of interesting because you really being there in France and choosing to go and follow God's call and, being you you don't have a huge community of of believers around you it just shows that here we have to remember and take with a grain of salt when we feel like well we're just not you know being fed with our community here and but to just stay the course and when those things come like cling tired to Jesus and it's not you know our brothers and sisters around the world are experiencing hardship and are experiencing isolation and i think these are even some of the things you experience here, but you have this idea here. There's like a cultural thing here where, well, that's not what it's supposed to be. So it must be wrong if that's how I'm feeling, but really it just pushes us closer to the heart of Jesus, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's true. It's, it's interesting being overseas because you have to process not only the culture that you're in, but you are constantly affronted with your expectations of the culture you came from. Mm Mm-hmm. And I would say as a missionary and anybody that wants to live overseas and actually anybody married, (laughs) I think all Christians need to go through a period where they understand what expectations are, understand the way that they expect things of themselves and others, whatever situation you're in, but especially in ministry. And you need to really pour um, humbleness over it and, and ask the Lord's grace to cover it because expectations is really what gets you in trouble. Like when we got, when we got the surprise of Emma, I had the best, I mean, maybe because I was 23 and I was so young, but (laughs) I had the best year with her because I had no expectations of what mothering was going to be like, not one, because I had never planned it. I had never thought of it. 
And it took surrendering everything in me and realizing how beautiful a thing it was. And I was just, I felt our year together was so blessed. It was so amazing that we wanted more kids. (laughs) And it's the same in ministry and living overseas. It's like here, it could be amazing unless you're going to hold expectations of what it's supposed to be like. And in America, being a part of the body of Christ in the true sense is amazing unless you have expectations that are not biblical of what it's supposed to look like. We are all given the same mission. We're given the mission to glorify God before others and that his power through the glory of of him is what transforms others and ourselves. And that the first thing we should be doing, whether you're just coming to the Lord or you've been with the Lord for 40 years, you should be looking for opportunities to serve those around you. And I had a good friend tell me once, like, every time I start to feel like it's more inward, it's more inward, and I can't, I can't get out of my own head, she looks for the first opportunity to serve someone else. And I have kept that on field because it's so easy to get discouraged and feel like I'm not doing anything, I'm not going anywhere, and I'm so far away. Is it worth it? Like you said earlier with the, like, is this from the Lord? Is this not from the Lord? In the waiting, man, if you are not strong in the Lord, in the word every day, in your prayer life, in the waiting for his response, you can get yourself in trouble. Oh yeah. And all those expectations get, will just eat at you. And the and, and the enemy comes in and speaks lies. And so unless you are really dependent on him for that, and I love that turning in service to somebody else. And that is always the best way. And it's so interesting because that was Jesus, what Jesus did when he walked on earth consistently was serve mm. others. It was like day in, day out. Read the whole, you know, all of the gospels, the overarching thing is I am serving you. I am serving you. I am serving you. And that's like the example that we have. That was part one of my conversation with Lisa. Be sure to tune in next Friday for part two, where she dives a little bit deeper into life in France and the things that she has learned. Okay, friends, that's it for today. I'm truly grateful you joined us. If you think others would be encouraged by this episode, you can easily share it by taking a screenshot and adding it to your stories or feed. You can also text it to a friend. New episodes are available every Friday. Be sure to subscribe so you can catch them all. You can find and interact with me on Facebook and Instagram at Married Rogers Neighborhood as well as my website, which I linked in the show notes. If you enjoyed the show today, I would so appreciate if you could take a second to rate and give a five-star review. It helps more people find it, which makes a huge difference for me and the podcast. Just remember, we are in this together. God loves you, and you are not alone. See you next time.